Kevin Spacey, Kazayoshi Aganuma, H.P. Lovecraft, John Tron. What do these four men have in common? Well, they're all relatively familiar to extremely recognisable creators, or have at least taken part in the creation of something of a similar pedigree. Kevin Spacey is an acclaimed, Academy Award-winning actor with a career spanning several decades and including films like Seven and American Beauty. Kazuyoshi Aganuma is an experienced animator and director, having worked on the film Acura, but is best known for directing the anime adaptation of Recovery of an MMO Junkie. H.P. Lovecraft is an incredibly influential writer in the realm of sci-fi and weird fiction, having more or less given birth to his own eponymous subgenre of horror. And John Tron is an extremely recognisable and popular internet creator and comedian, arguably single-handedly responsible for the growth of the flex tape meme industrial complex. They've all also said and done some... some pretty fucked up stuff. Spacey is a disgraced has-been and sexual predator, with multiple sexual assault allegations under his belt which he tried to distract people from with a poorly timed coming out. Yaganuma is a holocaust denier who blames Jewish finances for World War II and doesn't seem to believe that gas chambers existed? Lovecraft is… well, we all know what he called his cat. And John Tron has made statements defending white genocide conspiracy theories and has parroted absurd statements about race and crime. Also, he said the n-word a lot. Are you making observational comedy right N now? Niggas all like, no! <laughs> I'm glad you had a visual with that, so that nobody gets it. <laughs> <laughs> Niggas all like, sob! Here's a, here's I'm an a alien, here's yo! A, here's Gamers, am I right? These people, and others like them, have had their hands in all sorts of media. Literature, film, animation, games, music, internet culture. If you're involved or invested in these fields, it's very hard to go without acknowledging the reach and influence these people can have, and in doing so, we find ourselves in a bit of a bind. Should we continue to acknowledge, appreciate, or even enjoy art, even if we know the people behind it are absolute trash? It's a debate that, despite the fervour it can generate, I don't think has an easy answer. Truth be told, I don't think there's any one true answer amongst the countless subjective ones. So why have I made this video then? Because even though there isn't one objective truth, that doesn't mean the many more relative answers are any less valid. Different people have their different reasons for subscribing to one particular viewpoint, and in understanding those reasons, especially those that aren't ours, we can have healthier, more meaningful conversations about art and the people who make it. Which is why I, an E-list YouTube anime essayist, have arrived to try and start those conversations. How should we judge the legacy of controversial figures and the art they leave behind? Should we shun everything to do with them, or continue to enjoy their creations in spite of it? And why do people do either? Why should we separate art from artist? Let's see what we can find. I'm out of tea. Probably the least controversial creator in that aforementioned quartet was Howard Phillips Lovecraft. And when I say least controversial, I'm not talking about his character. I'm talking about the ease with which people are able to separate him from his work. It's quite an open, accepted fact that Lovecraft was a paranoid xenophobe who was scared of anything that wasn't New English, let alone white. It's not an uncommon viewpoint to see the inhumane horrors he wrote about, like the Deep Ones, as a reflection of his views on minorities, views he was very honest about in his letters. And yet, despite that, many continue to engage with, enjoy, and draw inspiration from his literary corpus, people like me. Hell, if anyone should have a problem reading it, it should be someone who looks like this. So why do I and so many other people find it easy to separate art from artists in this case, whereas with someone like, say, J.K. Rowling, it's hard to even think about Harry Potter without cringing. 
In search of answers, I journeyed to a dark, infinitely horrifying place worthy of being the subject of its own cosmic horror tale. Reddit. Specifically, the subreddit r slash Lovecraft, where it turned out someone had already asked a similar question about a month prior, which saved me having to pose one myself. There were a few different responses. Some believed that acknowledging the simultaneous flaws and virtues of a work in its creator are a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Some brought up the historical context of the time and how you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone who wasn't racist in some way. And as long as we acknowledge those parts of Lovecraft and don't agree with him, then it's fine to engage in what we do like about him. Namely, his fiction. Someone mentioned that since Lovecraft's racism is unlikely to convert or sway anyone, that renders any worries about it moot, and that acknowledging it in Lovecraft's work might even help readers to identify problematic elements in other, more recent pieces. One person named a very interesting point, namely that, since Lovecraft is dead, purchasing and enjoying his works aren't directly supporting him, whereas buying Harry Potter books is directly supporting J.K. Rowling, who is alive. At least at the time of writing this, it, it, it will be a little awkward if uh, she does die at some point before I uh, publish this video. The point being that since it isn't supporting the dead problematic person creating it, it's fine to engage with their works, which, if that's the case, could apply to not just every single dead artist, but also every single living one once they die. JK, Gus Johnson, Chris Brown, R. Kelly, under this logic, it would be fine to engage with their works once they've passed, but... <sighs> I, I don't know. I feel that even if R. Kelly dies of food poisoning in prison or something, I... I still wouldn't want to listen to his voice. Perhaps it's not that they're dead that's important, but that they're before my time. Maybe that's what's required to comfortably separate art from artist. I did end up making a post asking this question, and though it didn't get much attention, I did get one fairly lengthy, quite interesting response from one user. They do bring up Lovecraft's death as a reason why he doesn't face a similar backlash to, say, JK, since, unlike her, Lovecraft isn't alive to learn from or face consequences for his poisonous beliefs. However, they also go on to say that separating art from the artist is, and I quote, a bit of a coward's way out. You can enjoy and appreciate the work of an artist without agreeing to their political or social views. That those views and prejudices may still factor into or find expression in a work is always a possibility, and readers have to deal with that. Some folks may take solace in the fact that as Lovecraft is dead and his work is in the public domain, none of their money directly supports him and they are free to remix his work and address his prejudices however they wish. Fans of Rowling are largely restricted to non-monetizable fanfiction at this point and she's still raking in the money from the books, films, the theme park, and associated merch. There's no way to get around that. I think many people appreciate Lovecraft despite his personal racism, just as many people enjoy Harry Potter, despite Rowling being a flaming bag of dog poo on the doorstep of life when it comes to things like whether trans women are women, or whether her goblins are actually coded with stereotypes for Jewish people. Short of a lobotomy, we can't go back to some state of innocence where we didn't know those authors had morally indefensible views, and in many cases, arguing that we separate the art from the artist is just a way to say, this person is trash but I still like their work. Which is okay. We don't have to put on some moral pretense. Lots of terrible people make great art. We can still recognize their talent and prejudices, and we still need to decide for ourselves how complicit we want to be in support of their works, or their legacy. In that sense, we cannot separate the art from the artist. Once you know Lovecraft is racist, it cannot really be unseen. You need to come to terms with that historical racism in your own way. Some people turn their back on Lovecraft and his works. Others may resolve to acknowledge his racism, but enjoy his work for the rich legacy they provide with the awareness that they should not repeat his prejudices in their own life. 
I find this take very intriguing, as it brings to light one of the issues I have with separating art from the artist, that I see it used as an excuse to keep supporting objectively terrible people, while still trying to keep some kind of moral high ground. Too often I've seen it used with an air of condensation. Wait, 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 no. Too often I've seen it used with an air of condescension, trying to make the other person feel like an idiot for having a legitimate issue with the creator doing something that made them uncomfortable, and yes, I am talking about Kanye West. Fortnite balls, I'm gay, I like boys, I kidnap artistic kids, little Mosey is watching T-Rex, I'm EDP, big Kanye West. Yay, 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 yay. What the fuck do I say about yay? Though I was obviously aware of who he was growing up, how could you not be? By the time I was actually old enough to properly listen to and appreciate his music, he had already started his slippery descent into the sad car crash we see today. And speaking as someone who only knows him as said sad car crash, that has definitely filtered how I view his music, which I only really started listening to in mid-2021. I'm actually currently writing a video detailing my thoughts as I go through his discography, so subscribe and ring the bell if you want to be notified when that comes out after the, the heat death or something. Think of this section almost as a prelude of sorts to that video. When it comes to Ye, I admit I struggle to find patience with him. Some of my acquaintances are very familiar with this saying of mine, but I'm of the opinion that he needs to spend less time in the booth and more time in a therapist's chair. I have been endlessly frustrated by many of his fans who seem to be willfully ignorant of the fact that we are watching a man spiral out in real time, causing damage to himself and everyone around him. To be fair, I have recently come to understand this mentality though. FD Signifier made a very good video about Kanye and his descent, pointing out that, to a lot of the black men of his generation, Kanye represented something truly unprecedented. I really can't get across enough how refreshing and affirming this felt to me and almost every dude I knew at the time. Finally, we had an avatar an icon that really represented who we actually were. Kanye had used his personal tragedy to manufacture his own push. And Kanye had went from the potential baby face that people liked on the low to the face of the game, the champion, the main eventer, the headliner. And for the next few years, he would have a run that probably would never be repeated. When it's put like this, I can absolutely understand, especially as a black, generally masculine presenting person myself, why so many people hold on to him the way they do. However, I still did not grow up with Kanye. I have no real nostalgia for his music or any attachment to the person himself, and though I respect the massive influence he's had on contemporary hip hop and music in general, I find him extremely draining, exhausting, and infuriating to follow. Which does affect how I engage with his work. I don't. Outside of listening to his albums for my video, I don't listen to his songs in my free time at all, even the ones I do like. I just find his overall personality and behavior so disagreeable that I find it hard to put him out of mind even when I'm just listening to his music, especially since Kanye is someone that puts a lot of himself, for better and for worse, in his music. But let's go back to the discussion we saw in the Lovecraft subreddit and ask why I feel this way. Is it because Kanye is still alive right now and I can still support him? I can't say that's something I ever really thought about much before this video, and I don't think that's the reason. As I mentioned earlier, if someone like R. Kelly, Chris Brown, or J.K. Rowling died, I still don't think I'd be able to enjoy their work with a clear mind. For instance, I only found out about Pop Smoke after he died, but the second I heard the line, I can fuck with these niggas cause niggas is gay, that still put me off listening much further. Is it because he and Kanye exist in my era? Because I can observe the fallout and consequence of their actions in real time? Possibly? William Shakespeare was in all likelihood a racist. He'd probably call me a... a, a half-bred slave cuck or 
something, but I still enjoy a fair bit of his work. So, is that the answer? Is temporal distance the factor that affects how easily one can separate art from the artist? Does perhaps the medium have an effect? Hearing the voice and the words makes it a little more intimate than simply reading them, making it harder to ignore the artist behind the art. Could that have an effect? So far, we've found reasons why people might not separate art from artists, and reasons why they might, but no real definitive statements, if they even exist. I'm starting to get the feeling that we've hit somewhat of a plateau, and there's only so much perspective and analysis that I can give myself. So I asked several of my fellow essayists to give their own thoughts on the topic, hoping that their doing so will allow me to stall for time, come to an informed conclusion, is what I, what, what I meant to say. Play. Hi, my name is Max Tallinn. I'm a film scholar and a video essayist. The more I think about this question, the more I realize that most people arguing over the separate the art from the artist question, whether they're arguing for or against it, are arguing about whether it's morally acceptable to separate art and artist. Which is to say that the whole debate just assumes, out of the gate, that such a separation is even possible. But I don't think it is. I'm reminded here of a great quote from the author Alice Walker. She said, Books are byproducts of our lives. So deliver me from writers who say the way they live doesn't matter. I'm not sure a bad person can write a good book. If art doesn't make us better, then what on earth is it for? Now, I think we could spend like an hour on each sentence there, but for me the gist is that an artist leaves residues of who they are in every artistic choice they make. So, Alfred Hitchcock, for instance, was notoriously abusive to some of his actresses, but he uses his camera abusively too. So to watch a Hitchcock film is to be trained to watch in an abusive manner. You can't separate Hitchcock from that because it's in the films. So why do we still give him so much oxygen? And why do we give others like him so much oxygen? And I'm not saying that we should lie about the past or expunge him from film history. It's our duty to study and learn from the past. But when it comes to art for pleasure and edification, I don't think there's any artist whose absence would leave an unfillable gap. We can endure without Hitchcock, and without a lot of other people too. And you know why? Because we don't live lives of infinite length. We have to prioritize who we give our time to. So why waste it debating whether some famous person stays in or out? Let's instead run to voices for whom there's no question. And let's become better people thanks to their art. Because like Alice Walker said, if art doesn't make us better, then what on earth is it for? You know, I'm, I'm sort of in a weird place when it comes to separating the art from the artist. I'm not really sure what my rules are. I mean, sometimes I have no problem doing it. Like, I'm totally fine listening to the Beatles, even though I know John Lennon is, like, an awful person. But then, there are other times where I feel a little more conscientious about it. Like, as much as I love Baby Driver, I can't watch that movie and not think about Ansel Elgort and Kevin Spacey, and I just get really uncomfortable. So, I'm, I'm not really sure where the line is, or... or or, or what makes it okay versus not okay, um, I just know that, that sometimes it doesn't bother me and sometimes it really bothers me. I think at the end of the day it comes down to whether or not the artist will benefit from me supporting the art. So like in the case of John Lennon, he's dead, so me listening to the Beatles isn't giving him any money. But for things like Baby Driver, I'm not as sure. It's a little more of a, a gray area, so I, I, I don't know. It's a problem I, I haven't quite figured out yet, and, and I don't know that there ever will be a very satisfying answer. There's a line that an artist can cross. After that line is crossed, then no, I can't separate the art from the artist. As a woman who likes old media, I just kind of have to deal with the fact that some of my favorite historical authors would not have considered me a person. Under the right circumstances, 
And by right circumstances, I mean it's a really good book and the author's been dead long enough. I can put up with a little bit of light woman hating because I know that I'm engaging with work from another time. Whoever I'm reading is so long gone that their ideas are just echoes in the long halls of history. It's different when the artist is alive now. History isn't there to excuse their ignorance. I can't make excuses for them, him, her. Let me emphasize the her, because I'm talking especially about J.K. Rowling, whose ideas about who is and isn't a woman belong deep in the garbage heap of the past. I have too little time on this earth to appreciate all the good art that has been made. I don't want to waste that time compartmentalizing harm that is being actively done during my own lifetime. So my perspective on art and artists is informed by two polarities, a critical theory and communism. And yet they effectively arrive at the same conclusion. And this is because post-modernity and late capitalism are irrevocably intertwined. On the one hand, the nature of textual production, in this case the actual writing of the text, illustration of the drawing, or composition of the song, isn't something which occurs in a textual vacuum. There are no texts whose meanings are not dependent on other texts. Or, to put it another way, how an author crafts a work will be informed and influenced by elements like linguistic, literary, and genre or artistic conventions, to say nothing of all the works which precede it. In opposition to the hegemonic significance prioritizing the author as THE source of a text's meaning, there are equally, if not more so, compelling avenues for textual exploration. While on the other hand, the nature of cultural consumption in late capitalism necessitates that, as individual, atomized, and alienated consumers, the single recourse afforded to us, providing any sense of agency at all, are our choices of what products to purchase. Consumption really has become the last frontier of activism. But this is of course illusory. The ineffectiveness of even widespread boycotts notwithstanding, Systemic change, the kind of seismic shifts in material relations which would be necessary to effectively combat institutionalized racism, sexism, homophobia, and so on, are not to be found at the sharp end of your credit card. But perhaps you can now see how one hand washes the other. I think in some ways this topic has been a tad overblown when examining art. Art, like any profession, has a bunch of bad people that do bad things in their personal or even work life. But I think the issue people have is, art is personal. You resonate with stuff someone is making. For me, it's much easier to draw a line when it comes to being shown said person in question compared to people behind the camera or listening to music. Like I don't think I'm ever going to watch House of Cards because of you know who. Whereas there are very few directors that I wouldn't watch their films because of a bad director. And in general, I kind of find this bad director equals don't watch movie kind of undermining a lot of voices that worked on a particular project. Music is a little different as it can be one singular voice creating something, but music often comes with attachment as well. Like if I found out tomorrow Frank Ocean punches baby penguins at the zoo in his free time. I'd probably still be okay with blasting self-control when I'm in my fields because that song means a lot to me. Like I'm sure there's a superintendent that is a scumbag of a human being, but there are still hard construction workers that were able to get the thing built. What are you gonna do? Cancel a building? This is a joke, I swear. Oh, they're done. Um, <clears throat> well, um, uh, now that we've heard the thoughts of both myself and several of my contemporaries, where does that leave us? We've explored several different reasons, from the ethical to the economical, for why people take the sides they do, but it all comes down to that same question. Should we or should we not separate art from the artist? Well, as I said at the beginning, I don't think there's any one true answer to this question. It's kind of anticlimactic, I know, but I think that's kind of the problem here. 
This isn't an easy question with an easy answer. Sometimes there will be cases where it's easy to say what we should do, other times things will be far more ambiguous, and to expect that there's one obvious conclusion to every question? That's part of the reason why discussions, not just about this topic, but so many discussions online, are so vitriolic. Despite how I might have branded it, the purpose of this video was less to try and establish a solid, concrete answer, but to simply explore the question, to seek out and understand viewpoints. Although personally, I do believe there is a point that, once crossed, makes it impossible to continue supporting an artist. Generally, assuming they aren't a war criminal or something, everyone has to draw their own line in the sand. And even that line doesn't have to be firm. Each situation is unique, each piece of art is unique, as unique as the person that created it. It's okay that there isn't a quote real answer, you must come to your own conclusion. And you can certainly try and convince other people of yours, but just like you, only they can come to their own conclusion. If there is anything you choose to take away from this video, let it be this. Art is emotional. It is human expressiveness and creativity given form, and we all engage with it in our own emotional, expressive and creative ways. Respect how other people choose to experience art. If we do that, then I think it could lead to a more open, comfortable, diverse, and ultimately, a more artistic space for discussion. A space like my Patreon, link in the description below. Okay, I lied, there's only one person there, but... It could be. Thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to support the channel further, then I'd recommend subbing to my Patreon, where depending on the tier you sub at, you can get access to things like behind the scenes content, director's commentaries, uh, credits at the end of my videos, and an early listen to some of my music, which you might have actually heard in this video. I don't know yet. If not, then you can also give a one-time donation to my Ko-fi, buy my already released music on Bandcamp, and of course, like, comment, share, and subscribe. I'll see you soon. Bye bye. I just winked there, but you, you couldn't tell because of the, the glasses.